Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Not Too Comic Book. This week is show where we talk about TV shows and our adaptations of comic books. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about The Boys, Season 4, Episode 6. A great episode. A lot of really interesting things went down in this episode, so let's break it down. This episode is just another reminder of just how... In the words of Billy Butcher, how effing diabolical this show is. It is so... Oh, God. They were like, let's... We're not going to... We're not going to make this episode six of this season Herogasm. We're going to make it like Herogasm light. We're going to get some of that debauchery in here. I mean, oh, my God, dude. This might be the most debauchery-ridden episode next to Herogasm. Okay. So, breaking it down, we're picking up in the aftermath of, obviously, for Huey, losing his dad. And... They had to spread his ashes like at the where uh, made what was it made in Manhattan or whatever was like just, like plotted around or whatever. I don't know if the movie was actually filmed there or not. And Huey and his mom are just like yeah because uh, Huey's dad loved the movie so much. Even though it's like they're like yeah it's a bad movie. Yeah it's a really really bad movie. Um, and then it's also like I love his mom asking like oh so what's up with your friend? It's like oh Kimiko yeah she's upset about you know uh, her my friend Frenchie who uh, ended up you know going getting himself arrested for like a whole bunch of murders he committed for a mush, Russian mob. She's mostly like mad because uh, he did it without telling her. And just his mom just like who the hell are your friends? And it's like yeah you just got to peek into your son's life. She's leaving but she's like I can't stick around. But he's like no I'm good you know. Um, so obviously him and his mom are in a better position because they were joking. He's like, yeah, you know, they still need voctality and stuff like that. So I, I mean, but I mean, it's it's kind of nice. Like his mom's still out there and that they are in a better place. This the sad circumstances. It is sad that a tragedy had to bring them together and an extra tragedy brought them even closer. They have because they they only have each other in this world. So, but either way, um, so many weaving things going together. Uh, they need to, I, I forgot what set this up. Well, first and foremost, they learned from a train that, uh, Cameron is dead. There was some debate on whether or not Cameron was dead. Those squishy sounds made it sound like he got pulverized. Plus, cause that, the first hit, he was grunting, making a sound. After that, he went dead silent when the punches, the blows kept continuing. I was like, no, he's super dead. And they're making it seem like he's just on a sabbatical. So I'm like, how long you want to keep that up before you're like, oh yeah, he died in a tragic accident or something. They, they have to spin that. The fact is they're not even bothering to do that because they want to keep things uplifted. And now, you know, Firecracker's taking over the whole, like, she's hosting that situation. She's feeling great about it, so... And then proceeded to talk about some laser that Jewish people have in space. And you're just like, okay, cool, 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 We Once again, it's firecracker, so that should not come as any surprise. Um, and this all happens while, like, M.M.'s been trying to keep the team together. More so than anything, he's been trying to keep himself together. Despite taking down Soldier Boy, it, I mean, just because, like, the root... The sort of root of everything that kind of led to his OCD and stuff, it's still there. He's anxiety driven. Like he's he's stressed out. He's trying to use an app mindfulness to like calm himself down, but it's not working. This job does not allow for you to be calm. It's just once again, it, it is. It, I think that is so interesting. He confronted the past last season, but now it's like it's still rooted in him so much that it's like despite the core to all that being going, it's like it's still like you kind of got the mind goblins where it's like it can't. Not mind gobbling my nuts. I'm not. I wasn't even trying to like set that up or anything. It was just like mind gobblers in the regards of like you're, you, you're. There's certain ticks and everything that you just can't quite get rid of, and it's just. So he's dealing with that. Uh, they find out the only a person that got an invite to the party because uh, it's going to be a party at Tech Knight's place, and it's going to be. Um, they web weaver for whatever reason got an invite he's this world's weird junky version of spider-man it almost feels like it's meant to be like a play on like was it peter b parker the the peter parker from spider-verse that was kind of like super down in his life but he i haven't seen uh, across the spider-verse yet I, I that's just something that's been on the list i just haven't uh, gotten to yet but it's like you know and at least in this first spider-verse movie he was kind of he was kind of pretty rough so it almost feels like that Spider-Man, but even more effed up. I mean, they've done that to Peter in the comics too, where they've just like made him. I mean, the whole point is like, yeah, he's only, he's supposed to be miserable, you know, but it's like, that's kind of part of his story is being broken, miserable. And now it's kind of like, this is to the like 10th power. 
And poor M.M. always getting stuck with the most gross, effed up things. Home dude's like, oh, you gave me those drugs? Yeah, I need you to shoot it into my butthole. And you're just like, oh, God. He's like, oh, I'll do it later then. And so M.M. has to do it. Initially puts it in his spider hole. And you're just like, oh, my God. And it's, it's just, uh, ew, ew. It's like, that's the first no, 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 no of the episode. Then he puts it in his butt. Then it squirts in his face. And you're just like, Jesus. Like, literally... M.M. had the most jizz on him last season. And it's just like, man, can't catch a break. Also, there are so many cheeks out this episode. First, you had Web Weaver's cheeks out. And you had Huey's cheeks out so much this episode. It's like, oh, man, there's so much male butt in this episode. It's insane. Uh, so, either way, uh, stole the costume. And now Huey has to be him, which... Once again, the deeper levels of, oh, it's kind of interesting. He's not Spider-Man, but he is, uh, he does voice Superman in My Adventures of Superman. So it's just kind of interesting him playing into like, an, oh, here he is uh, playing the role of another hero, uh, at least an in-universe hero. And everyone's kind of laughing at him because of how like ridiculous the outfit looks. But, you know, and he has to kind of talk like him, like, no, nah, no cap, dog. So he shows up there. Luckily, the suit hides his scent, so it keeps him from Homelander and um, Tech Knight. They knew Tech Knight was going to be there. They didn't know Victoria as well as like the Seven were going to be there. So that was kind of sucky. But it all worked out uh, in a lot of ways, too, because of that. There's this situation, like kind of like on the whole, like being able to kind of hide yourself a little bit. I, there's this conversation where like, where Homelander was talking to Newman about, like, what happened to Stan. It's like, well, to be fair, she had nothing to do with him getting out of prison. She did help him escape later on, you know, at the end of last episode. But she initially had nothing to do with him getting out of prison. She's like, oh, kind of feigned ignorance. Doesn't seem like, like, Homelander's a little suspicious. But we know he can read people. He can, like, he's, he's not as, like, perceptive as Tech Knight. But he does have, like, he can hear your heart pounding and stuff. And, you know, so... The fact is that he didn't call Newman out either. He was just kind of playing super close to the vest. Or it's more so supposed to be a thing of... Because Newman was raised by Stan. So he could have taught her how to kind of always keep a calm composure. So that she's never, like, you know, found out. I mean, let's not forget, like, she was, she was a wolf in sheep's clothing for so long in the show. So she's very good at faking and, like, keeping calm and never revealing herself. You know, she does have that separation of being Nadia and Victoria, but she also acknowledged she's not dealing with both identities like Annie is. But I also wonder, is it because she is a bloodbender that she's able to like calm her heart down? Like I wonder if she, that that feels like that could be another level of like how she's able to like prevent herself from getting nervous or like her heart pounding too loudly. It's like, no, I can calm it down. Cause like Homelander, he typically will call someone out being like, oh, your heart's pounding. Like I know you're lying, but he never did. So he's kind of like, mm, what's going on here? Once again, they all know her to be a head popper, but once again, the only person, to our knowledge, that knows that she's a bloodbender. I, I mean, I, I don't even know if Stan knows that she's a bloodbender. He knows she can pop heads because that's just been her motif since she was like a, like a teenager or whatever. Or, yeah. Uh, but the only person we, as the audience, know for sure knows that she's a bloodbender is Marie. So... It just makes you wonder, does Homelander know? Because, I mean, Ed, Stan might know, and Homelander might know by extension of, right, like, Stan's extensive files on her stuff. So he probably knows. He's probably one of the only other people that knows her power. Because she's, like, the only, outside of the boys, she's the only other person that knows that they are, uh, that um, Victoria's a, a soup. No one else does. Well, now, well, Sage does. Because I doubt, I doubt even the boys know that she's a bloodbender. They probably just think, like, once again, her power is just, like, popping heads. So, which I love that bit in the episode where that uh, guy, I don't know if he's, like, a senator or whatever. We haven't seen him since, I want to say season one was the last time we saw him. Uh, he's the dude that hooked up with Doppelganger unknowingly and they were blackmailing him for that. Uh, he was talking to Victoria about abortion. He's like, yeah, like, if a sexual assault situation is... A legitimate the female body will naturally know that and it won't uh won't let the pregnancy process happen it's like uh-huh 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 and he's like talking about like kind of you know illegal like making abortions illegal and you're just like cool cool and victoria imagined exploding her own head which i was like oh that's interesting i was like oh 
slight spoilers. Uh, I was about to, I'm about to reference something to kind of slight spoilers, but I was like, oh, she pulled a, I'm not okay with this. That's, that's interesting. Highly recommend you check that out. Sadly, the show got canceled after one season, but the comic's really good. I would highly recommend it. It's by the same dude, Charles, is it Foreman? It's something like that. Forson? He's the dude who wrote the, uh, book that, he wrote the, the comic, The End of the Effing World, so. Just kind of fun comic stuff, just, it just immediately made me think of that, so. And I just want to stay on that really quickly since I am on that subject. I like the conversation between Victoria and and Sage where it's like, okay, it kind of – like Victoria's kind of wondering like how can I keep being around these type of people? This sucks. They suck. I don't know how I'm able to just kind of like smile and nod to all this BS. And then Sage talks about her story about her grandmother having a very specific form of like leukemia and it's like my mom like she had a big laugh but she was bedridden she became like small and frail and she's like at a young age i discovered a cure but i brought that up to people and they smiled and laughed and pat me on the head like oh my god you're so adorable and my grandmother died screaming in agony and pain and it was kind of a lesson that she had to learn at a very young age she's like i can literally cure cancer i can end so many problems in the world but i choose not to because what's the point because humans are animals and no one's going to take me seriously and she's like fine let people underestimate you you're going to have like that's how you do this whole situation with these people you have one hand in their pocket while you use the other one to slice their throats and it's just like it's kind of like because i think this episode also kind of sympathizes like makes you have this sympathy for uh, Sage, because it is this burden of being the smartest person in the world when no one takes you seriously. Because once again, she always has to correct people. They're like, oh, she's the smartest woman out of it. Smartest person in the world. Because it's just like, there's always going to be that asterisk beside how smart she is. But even being smarter she is, like even she has her blind size because even Ashley shows up and she's like, well, you're not invited. It's like, no, Tech Knight and I go way back. So, oh, it seems like you didn't see that coming. So even she has her blind spots. And I'm curious, it, do these blind spots come up because there is a period of time where she's not smart? Like she has like at least twice that we're knowing of over the course of the show so far where she's dumbed herself down. The first time she hooked up with the deep and the second time she hooked up with the deep, she dumbed herself down. And so maybe that kind of created a gap where she... Uh, wasn't calculating all this stuff and wasn't ready to be blindsided by all this. I don't know. Just because, just, like I said, just being as smart as she is, there's still like even stuff even she can't. She isn't omnipotent. She may seem like she is, but no, it's like no. Even stuff does. It, it showcases there is stuff that does slip through her radar because she didn't. She, she didn't see them showing up at uh, the boys uh, showing up like they did. Um, even that kind of caught her off guard. You thought she would have been more well prepared like she was, uh, uh, in episode two. Like, she was ready for them then, but Dota caught off guard this time, so makes you wonder. I also love that Homelander kind of put Tech Knight in his place. He's like, yeah, like, we're so great. Because it is, because Tech Knight is supposed to be the Batman of this universe. I think the parallel, like, I mean, they lean into the parallels even more this episode. But obviously when, like, we, we got introduced to him in Gen V, they leaned into, like, him being kind of very, like, I mean, he's like a more superpowered version of Batman because of his, like, enhanced senses, which makes him a good enough detective in his own right. But... I love the parallel of like, yeah, it's Superman and Batman essentially in this universe. But Homelander's like, yo, don't get it twisted because he's like, oh, number one and number two, which is, you know, typically how that is. Like in the hierarchy that is DC on the hero front, at least popularity scale wise, it is one and two. It depends on who you ask. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's Superman and Batman. Obviously, Batman's the bigger hero, I think, on a pop cultural zeitgeist. I think he is. He's the bigger name. I would assume, like, merchandise and franchise-wise, I think it's Batman. Um, but, like, you know, once again, it's, it's the bit, you know, he's... They are part of the big three. that The, the trinity that is him, Super, Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman. But anyway, I'm going on this whole tangent, but I love that. It's, he kind of, Homelander kind of pulled a bit of a Kendrick Lamar being like, no, 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 there is no big three, it's big me. You're pathetic, you're on the lower end of things. Don't ever, don't ever put us in the same league again. And it's like, oh, look at him. He's, uh, he's so kooky. And, uh, but yeah, he brings Webb Weaver to his little uh, pseudo-bat tech cave. 
and it's literally a sex dungeon. I was like, oh. I was like, because I was like, okay, like, it's got to be a parody bat cave. But it's like, no, it's a sex dungeon. And his butler, Elijah, which I was like, oh, where do I recognize that actor from? Um, he was in this short-lived show on NBC called Debris. He's uh, the father. I forgot the char- one of the main characters, her father. He played that. It was like, oh. But he's like the Alfred, but he's the one that, like, cleans up after... Uh, Tech Knight's debauchery, and you're just like, oh, oh. Also, he has his um, he has his uh, sidekick, like in a you know red gimp suit, like stuck, like chained up to the side. And it, I guess it's also supposed to lean into and kind of parody the whole like. There's always been like that thing of like, oh, the jokes about Batman and Robin of like how like, oh, having a young boy in tights around, you, like you know, there's always been that thing that's kind of gotten slung against Batman because of that whole thing. Uh, so it feels like it's kind of like parroting and, and leaning into the, that. So that whole secret, like all everything associated with all of that was wild. The fact is that Huey uh, had to sit on a cake, bare ass, and fart on it. While Tech Knight choked himself with a chain, like erotic asphyxiation, which... They even say it later on in the episode. I feel so bad that it's so fucked that every time I think of, like, every time I see some erotic asphyxiation wise, which, let me make that clear, it's not like it comes up that often, but it comes up often enough that it pops in my head that I'm like, oh, David Carradine. It, it feels so fucked that that's a, literally the thought I had. And then later on, like, Elijah's like, oh, yeah, like he was a big fan of David Carradine or something like that. It's like, oh, boy. Oh, boy. So, yeah, like, I was like, oh, God, like I said, the debauchery in this episode is fucking next level, dude. It's just like, oh, God. And then Ashley gets involved, and she's really into this. And we knew Ashley was a freak. She pegged Cameron. She also stepped on his balls. And we also saw, like, when um, Deep was about to blow A-Train in the first episode, we saw her lean in and smile. I mean, once again, she is a dom, so she really gets off on, like, that power tripping shit. So it, like... You know, that excites her. And just her saying, like, the wildest shit to Huey while he's in that, uh, because he's, he's tied down. I was like, dude, I mean, we know Ashley pegs Cameron. So I was like, is she going to try and peg Huey? I was like, uh, I feel bad for you, Huey. Um, dude, there's a show I would recommend you watch. Show the, the show was sadly canceled after two seasons. It is based on a comic. I don't know if the comic ever covered it in this. Uh, it kind of gave me, well, let me talk about the show I'm referencing. There's a show called Happy that has a, has a, someone being strapped down and about to be, like, pegged situation. It kind of goes through, it, you know, I'll, 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 I'll leave it at that, but uh, it, it's a comic book series. It's, it's a TV show that was based on a comic book by Grant Morrison. Um, it's a great show, like, highly recommend you check it out. Like, even though it was canceled, I'd still highly recommend someone you checking it out. Um, but the other thing it made me think of, it's like, uh, Ving Grimes in, um, oh god, what the fuck, Pulp Fiction, it kind of gave me those same vibes too, I was like, oh boy, is this about to happen, is this about to happen, but like, she's tickling his feet, and then she's like, rub, like, masturbating, and just like, and she's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna eat you, I'm 100% cannibal, so I'm like, okay, cool, so we, we, uh, adding a little touch out Army Hammer to this. Whether there's validity to the cannibalism, I have not looked, you know, when the shit about Army Hammer came out, that's as far as I've looked into it. I've never watched a doc about his family. I haven't read deeply into, like, all the shit Army Hammer related. I know the cannibal stuff came up. Whether there's validity to that or not, I don't care. I'm just saying in this moment, just like, yeah, Army Hammer. You know what they were aiming for in that moment. It's like, but like I said, Ashley was just saying, like, the wildest thing of, like, yo, she's like, my my, I'm gonna put my swollen clit on your mask and then piss on you, and you're just like, yo, Ashley's like going hard in the pain. Like this is this is her this is her sanctuary. This is this is her this is her vibe. This is where she feels home. Yeah, at home, it's like, dude, and she got off so hard to it, and then like she like wipes her juices on the mask. You're like, yo. What the fuck is this show, dude? It's, oh, God. Oh, the show just always... They have too much fun on the show because you're just like, what the fuck is the behind the scenes for this show? What the fuck is the behind the scenes for this show? Like, I want to know what the behind the scenes of this episode was. The filming of this had to be insane. Okay, but either way, and just like Huey being like, oh, yeah, I was, I'm good. I, uh, uh like, uh, 
My, I, I, uh, I've got so much dry cum. It's like you could basically like shatter my underwear if you like uh, did anything to it. Also, love the whole like oh, trying to figure out his safe word, and he's screaming out spiderweb, and they're like, "What's that?" He's like, "Yeah, when I'm so turned on, I scream out random words." So he tried spiderweb, tried tarantula. I love that we find out the code word was Zendaya, which you're like, "Oh, that's fucking hilarious." I don't know how Zendaya is going to feel about <laughs> you. The world is what it is. There's no way that like a celebrity's name isn't someone's safe word. This it's my the, the wildest thing is there's too many people in the world for Zendaya not to be someone's like safe word. But it's like that's got to feel weird. But you also see the parody of it because it's like right this is Spider Man obviously Tom and Zendaya so it's like yeah it makes sense but it's still like oh god that's uh, that's fucking wild. Oh, but it was so effed up, too, because once he found out it was Huey, he was like, oh, like, before I hand you over to Homelander, I'm going to basically cut a new hole in you and fuck it. You're just like, oh, God, dude. Because he picked, like, at least two spots we saw in Huey, like, in the stomach and his side. It's like, that's hardcore disgusting and so fucked. And at the same time, this is all going down, like, the squad is trying to find their way in here. Because Annie already didn't want Huey to do it. You're not in the best mind state right now. Your dad just died. Like, take a beat. But he's like, no, I need to do this. I want to work. I want to, like, get my mind off of things. And it's like, yeah, pick the wrong day to want to go into work, huh? Holy shit. So, they go in. Uh, so many other moving pieces to this that I kind of, uh, I figured, like, Kimiko dropping her phone, I was like, okay, at at certain point in the episode, it hadn't really become as much of a problem, but it did with the A Train thing, where she had to work around that. But we'll get to that when we get to it. Um, a Train and Firecracker were probably having the least amount of fun at this party because, well, Tech Knight revealed that like, oh yeah, like he's eleven, like his his family's money comes from like eleven generations of being like, it's an eleven generation thing of money being passed down. It's like, oh yeah, this isn't like oh like celebrity money this is this is this is old old money and he talked about like his family were slave catchers and even saying this shit to like uh a train and it's like well he already had to do like the firecracker being there being fine with it too is so effed up but you're like damn that 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 and just like the casualness in which they're talking about it and be like oh like you know my grandpappy would have caught you and a train just has to be like yeah well guess we'll never know it's like jesus I mean, it's like A-Train's getting it from all sides. It's like, right, you already had to deal with a racist in Stormfront back in season two. It's like, I mean, we haven't, Firecracker and A-Train haven't really interacted. But, I mean, she's not as overtly racist towards him. I mean, she's kind of saved all that spite and heat for Sage. But, like, her and A-Train haven't really interacted, so that hasn't really come up. But it's like, yeah, I mean, Firecracker's racist as shit. So, like, that's, that's no, like I say, but he's just never had to deal with that like Sage has, so... But yeah, like Firecracker, you know, she's happy to be here, but like she gets left out of the big boy conversation. It's it's Homelander, uh, Sage, and Victoria, and she kind of gets told to like walk away. This is, oh yeah, like go enjoy yourself. And she's frustrated because she's always been on the outside as she talks about later in the episode. And it's like, yeah, that's also why she has such an issue with Star uh, Starlight because she felt like an outsider. She was made an outsider by Starlight and she's always struggled with that. She oh, she felt like she was finally accepted. She was part of the inner circle for the first time in so long. Most of her life she's had to like care. Like, because it is such a thing of like, right, you're like, right, that stuff when you're a teenager, why are you going to hold that against Starlight? That's kind of petty. Yeah, she said some effed up shit, but it's like, it's not that crazy. It's like, well, no, it's because of like the, the trauma it instilled in her where it's like, it... It does not excuse her going down the route she's going down, but it explains, like, right, she felt like an outsider. So a lot of the shit she spews to other people does seem applicable to herself of, like, she wants to be someone important. She wants to be someone significant, so. I don't know, just for a fleeting moment, it make you feel bad for her. Once again, you can, you can understand someone's past, what led them to be where they are, but it doesn't justify, it doesn't mean you have to agree with the choices that they've made up to that point. So her and Starlight having that face-to-face -face was interesting, where she's like, right, turns out, like, Annie's willing to admit, too, it's not like you were the only girl I ever talked and said horrible things like that, too, but she also recognizes, like, right, I can't pretend, like, oh, that was, I, that was Annie, and this, is, I'm Starlight, it's like, no, it's all one and the same, I can't keep the two separate, because I want to, like, have this dissonance between me and Starlight, but it's like, that is a part of who I am, and I can't, 
I mean, because to be fair, like, that's who she was, like, because she's always been Starlight, so she can't separate by being like, oh, that, that was Starlight, you know, and I reinvented it, it's like, yeah, it's all you, the good and bad is what makes up people, no one's all good, no one's all bad, well, and, you know, you like to believe not everyone's all bad, but, you know, there's that yin and yang of it all to, like, you know, people, so, but I'm curious, like, she still would have been, I mean, because even, um, uh, even Starlight was, you're still a cunt for what you did uh, in episode four, but she's like, at the end of the day, like, I am sorry for what I did, that I kind of had such a negative effect on you and did what I did, and I apologize about that. And it did seem like for a moment she was getting through to Firecracker, who knows how real that would have been, so it's probably better to have just drugged her and dragged her away. Um... There's a whole situation with M.M. and, uh, with M.M. and, uh, oh god, Sage. I don't know why Sage thought that was, well, I guess she thought she could at least have, get M.M. rattled enough that he would ha hesitate enough for her to get out of the room, I guess, or at least, like, set off the, like, security system, uh, but... Because she said, because she knows enough about him. It's like, oh, yeah, your daughter got suspended. It's like, oh, so you're keeping an eye on me. I guess kind of showing, like, right, all of the people connected to the boys are all, like, being monitored. I mean, there's only so much you can do because all the, the boys are, like, a government-funded, like, they are working with the CIA. So can't really do much, but you can keep an eye on and tabs on the people around them, so... I guess that's what also keeps them, like, being able to kind of freely move about however they want to because they do have that... You can't, like, kill them without drawing too much attention. You know, I guess that's kind of an unspoken thing in the show. At least, maybe that's an unspoken justification. Whatever the case may be. And she just kept running her mouth over and over again. It's like, yeah, your daughter is violent. She's violent because it comes from you because you have anger issues. And he shoots her. I was like, oh, shit. But I was like, well, she got shot in the head, so she's fine because... They don't really know about the brain regeneration ability of hers. And in that moment, M.M. like passes out. I was like, did he have a heart attack? Turns out he had a panic attack. And it was actually A-Train that saved him. And there is this beautiful moment when A-Train ends up saving him and dropping him off at the hospital. And this little kid looks at him and smiles. I think for A-Train, it was like, right, for the first time, it's like, I saved someone. And it felt good to be viewed genuinely as a hero and so because i did something heroic and someone looked at me that child like warned me like oh my god it's a superhero you did something cool and amazing and it felt good in that moment to be a hero not you know orchestrated bs you know where people believe you're a hero because of that it's like for this first month time and maybe ever or in a very long time at the very least it felt it was genuinely like oh my god i'm accepted as a hero Luckily, before Huey uh, got the uh, scalpel or the knife, uh, luckily they showed up to take down Tech Knight, and they strung him up, and now it's a situation of, yeah, he's a masochist, so you can't really torture him without him getting off to it, so it's like, what do we do? It's like, well... Uh, his sidekick broke free and was like, no, 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 I'll tell you, you basically, here's his money, access to his bank accounts after a retinal scan, and he started giving his money away to all these different organizations, like a hundred million to Black Lives Matter, and I love how that's the one that pissed him off the most. He was upset, but the other ones, he's like, no, not them. It's like, that would pissed him off the most, you know, so. But it turns out that their plan is to essentially make internment camps for those who do not agree with Homelander. So you're like, cool. Once again, this is going to ship over into a full-blown dictatorship. Like, I mean, it's always going to go in that direction anyway, you know. But like, yeah, going to lock people up who don't agree with you. And well, some members of your team would probably want a certain other people locked up. It's like so interesting too, considering like, uh sage said the whole thing of like right you don't need the master race thing she's like that's so uh you don't need the master race like german bay did that that's so that's so german you know like nazi bay did that's so german but i'm like i don't you kind of feel like mm, when this kind of but i guess it's like that's perfect race versus like creating a perfect world and society once again we still don't know what what the hell uh Sage is getting out of all of this. So we'll get to that in a second. 
But uh, the tech night situation is dealt with because Elijah, who's tired of cleaning up everything, he's like, I raised this kid. Uh, I've cleaned up so much cum. And it's like, yeah. And so he just like kills the guy and just like, yep. And him and his uh, tech night psychic just stay there. Say, yeah, we'll stage it like he died of erotic asphyxiation. So yeah, tech night is dead. So interesting. Kind of sad we won't see that character anymore in this universe, but you know. It is what it is. This universe lost. Like I said, he pseudo this universe as Batman. But it's just kind of interesting. That has to have happened in a comics at some point in time where like Robin and Alfred had to like not maybe not put Batman down, but like Bruce was like wilding out that they had to do something. It feels like if that storyline ever came up, it would be Dick Grayson as like Nightwing. I could see him like doing that more as Nightwing than his time as Robin, but whatever the case may be. Once again, not well versed enough in comics, but it feels like over the years there had to be storylines that revolved around that. I mean, because obviously Dick and um, Bruce have had their like beefs like you know over stuff but anyway tangents and all that aside so that situation resolved i mean it's actually really sad in the aftermath of it all like huey kind of breaking down being like yeah it's like uh, uh ashley tickled me until like while she was like getting off and it's like what else did she do and it's just like yeah just all that was like holy shit i was that close to you know there's there's a lot wrong in that situation and then on top of that like yeah I wasn't really ready to be back out in the field. I miss my dad. Holy shit, I miss my dad. And it's like, that's so heartbreaking. Because it's like, yeah, just, it was a distraction. It was a terrible distraction that didn't distract you from how shitty you were feeling and how much hurt you're going through. Circling back to MM really quickly. Uh, once again, it's not a heart attack. It's a panic attack. But if things continue down this route, he will eventually have a heart attack. So it's like, cool, whatever you're doing right now, stop it. And it's like, but this is too big and too important. And it's like, what should he do? Like, should he bow out permanently? Who knows Like, what the end result of that's going to be. But like, um, the safe situation, the moment she got up, I was like, wait. Her brain did kind of get scrambled, so is she going to be... And it's like, yep, she's an idiot right now. And Homelander doesn't know about that, because the only person who knows about that is the Deep, which I need to talk about the Deep in uh, Black Noir. But yeah, we had the whole situation there where it's like, okay, um, Homelander tried to freestyle that himself about, like, right, like, basically forming a coup. But he's like, no, 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 it's not, it's not a coup. It's yada, yada, yada. He's trying to spin it, but no one was buying what he was selling. It's very much, pretty much like... Homelander's first day of taking over Vought after, like, getting, um, giving Edgar the boot. And, like, it's like, oh, what about the Abita margins? And he's like, okay, do you think you're smarter than me? And, like, people are like, well, what about this? What about that? And, you know, the repercussions of this. And it's like, it's overwhelmed. And he does, because he's, the entire linchpin, the literal, like, foundation to everything, literally, it's all on Sage's shoulders. And without her... Which I also, like, I mean, it makes sense. Every time her brain has been scrambled, she's been super horny. I'm sure there's, like, like, I'm sure there's brain stuff that's related to, like, sexual, like, libido and stuff. Like, I'm sure there's, like, triggers and stuff like that in the brain. Uh, but it's come up three times now that when she gets stupid, like, she gets horny. Because she was like, oh, asking for something. She's like, I also could use a Sibian right now. I'm like, yo. I love that, really quickly, I love that look that Victoria gave her, like, yeah, and they kind of nod to each other, she keeps doing it, and Victoria's almost like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Yeah, but yeah, she, this was supposed to be her thing, and Victoria had to be the one that had to step up, and she kind of says, like, right, this isn't a democracy like people believe it is. She's like, why should, basically, they're, most of the general public is stupid. Why should they be allowed to have a vote? This should be about the corporations. You guys have made billion dollar companies, meaning you're smart enough to kind of run things. So I was like, okay, let's see where that's that's going. You know, so it's like, right, kind of making this country kind of run by committee of corporation and what's in their best interest. It's like, yeah, that's that's how Victoria's coming from this perspective, just like uh say said like right one hand in their pocket the other one to slit their throats when need be so it's kind of using them and you can see how upset it made homelander and you could tell ryan was kind of look at him and was like oh i thought this was supposed to be your time to shine dad but it kind of got usurped from you and it's like he he thought like fuck it i'm gonna do it myself i'm yeah i got this and he fumbled the bag so hard and it's just like so frustrating because it's just like this is my time to shine and she took it from me but it's also like you were like just everything that could go wrong in that moment went wrong so Staying on Homelander really quickly, uh, there's that scene later on between him and Firecracker. She's like, right, Starlight got away, and 
uh, it's like, right. It's like, well, you didn't, obviously you didn't want to admit the embarrassing part where it's like, wasn't even a tussle, wasn't even a fight because Annie's powers are still on a glitch because she needs to, once again, that's a psychological thing, um, got drugged and knocked out. But she's all saying like, right, you're so important to me. Because Homelander's like, like, all right, so uh, Cameron wasn't the leak. So who could it be? You know, like you were missing from the party. So maybe it could be you. Other people need to be vetted as well. Um, she was also using this opportunity to shit on Sage by being like, yeah, yeah she kind of wasn't really much help for you in this circumstance, was she? But she is a little vulnerable with Homelander. Once again, talking about, as I was bringing up previously, about the whole being an outsider thing. And I think it means a lot to Homelander to be like that, to basically be a god to some people, which is so interesting because he goes back and forth between like he loves people worshiping him and being scared of him and kneeling to him. But he also wants someone to foot, fight back and push back against his notions and his thoughts. But he also doesn't like that, you know? Because he talked about, like, right, being worshipped as a god, like, it didn't... But he also talked about them all running things like a god last episode, being wrathful gods, so... But being worshipped and loved like that by someone, it means a lot to him. And for, for her, it's like, right, you are my everything. That you, like, the fact is that I'm, like, the cornerstone of VNN now is because of you. You've inspired me. You've kind of helped make me who I am. And it's like, you, you've given me everything. You are my everything. And so she began, like, the moment she opens up her shirt, I was like, is she about to ask him to laser? I was like, are we about to have a Stormfront laser my tit situation again? And he was like, I'm not sexually attracted to you. She's like, this isn't about sex. I'm like, what the fuck is it then? And then she keeps opening. I'm like, where's this going? And proceeded to squirt milk. I was like, what the fuck? And it's like, oh, she injected herself with something that allows her to... It's like, yeah, it enlarges my heart a little bit, but I can produce milk now. And he's like, you you did that for me? And she's like, yes. And once again, she said she'd do anything. And she's like, oh, there's my baby boy. It's like, oh, what what you kind of got with Madeline is now back. I mean, we, we saw the bottles of milk. Once again, we don't know whose milk they are. It's like, would it be Madeline's after all this time? Who oh, God knows if he just like hijacked baby milk from a whole bunch of people. I have no idea. But why worry about that when you can get it straight from the source? And then just like, this is, like I said, I, I know I'm a perverted person. I mean, generally speaking, I'm, I have a very perverted mind, but generally speaking, I'm a very vanilla dude. But it's just like, even the pervert in me kind of had to pause moments in this episode and be like, this is a lot. This is a lot. You know, it's a little too spicy for me, even with my perverted mind. But it's still like, yo, this is this is in some, some insane shit. So, yeah. So, it's actually funny that this was actually advice that Sage had gave to Ashley. It's funny that firecracker would take that advice i i I don't know like she wasn't in the elevator at the time that advice was given to ashley so it's like she must have came up with that on her own how does she know about homelander and the milk thing not unless sage is the one that suggested that to her who god knows because that would only make sense considering sage it suggested it for ashley so okay uh circling over to the black noir and deep conversation First and foremost, I love because that was kind of like people's people had said this, so it was already kind of known. I don't know if I talked about it, but the actor who plays Black Noir, like now that he's taken off the mask, that's actually the actor who has been playing Black Noir for the past three seasons. He just gets to talk now, so it's like there's an extra layer of this funny thing of him being like, "Oh yeah, like I can't understand Black Noir. I can't really get into his character," which is like the irony and like the extra layer joke to it because he understands Black Noir because he's played Black Noir for the past three seasons. But it's also like, yeah, he's got this uh, these, uh, box full of, like, uh, these Buster, like, the, the little cartoon mascot things from last season. And it's like, oh, why would he have a whole bunch of those? And it's like, I have no idea. It's like, well, we as the audience know what that's all about. Uh, that was his coping mechanism with his trauma. Um, and him and Deep and uh, Black Noir had this whole conversation. Because, like, Black Noir's like, the new Black Noir's like, dude, I just want to leave. I'm not... A violent person. I don't like violence. The fact of the matter is, I I could go do this show thing that I'm going to be able to do for like three. They're going to let me fight. He's like, you know, I can actually fight. It's like, dude, we know that. It's like, oh, we see the audience didn't know that because we weren't sure. Like, we see he has superhuman strength, like Noir, but we didn't know. Like, once again, every soup has some varying levels of enhanced strength. Some like on the very very low end, some on the more higher end. So it seems like he might have it on the higher end, but it seems like his maybe his main gimmick is being able to fly. Which I also love that, like, uh, Homelander threw shade at Tech Knight, but being like, you can't even fly. Um, 
Which almost feels like that's supposed to only be like a... It's not the same thing, but it almost feels the like same like spite that Soldier Boy said to him at Hero Gasm. Being like, huh, you're wearing a, you think you're strong, buddy, you're wearing a cape, you know? So it kind of had that same spite and energy to it. But, you know, Deep said something that was so, that seemed like those lines of dialogue where he's like, right, like, you know, people laugh at me. It's that, that's kind of crazy, right? And Tech Knight's just, I'm not Tech Knight, Black Noir's like, yeah. And he's like, yeah. So what I did, he's like, sometimes like when you, you punch someone's nose in so much that it goes to the back of their skull or you beat them so much that they never walk again. And it's like, oh, you feel a rush of it because he's like, now they're not laughing anymore. You're like, ooh, it's so wild when people get like. He's always been disturbing, but, like, that is the most disturbed we've ever seen, like, the deep. Like, he's leaning into that darkness of, like, yeah, he went so, like, super psycho with those seat, like, those few lines. It's like, oh, like, he looks so disturbed in that moment. Like, yeah, they're not laughing anymore, which is so interesting. Firecracker said the exact same thing about people not laughing anymore. Interesting how that all works, which also obviously means a lot to Homelander too, considering like, well, Marty and the whole squirt situation, there was laughing involved in that. So maybe that also kind of registered with Homelander to some extent. But yeah, like, uh, I love that, uh, Deep was like, yeah, me and Black Noir, previous Black Noir, we were actually pretty good. We were pretty tight. We were pretty bros. I was like, really? Because if any, if he was pretty much bros of anyone, I'd assume the only person he was really bros with was Homelander to our knowledge. I don't know if that episode from uh diabolical the black noir it's like the season finale or you know i don't know if that's canonical or not the black noir and homelander episode but it's like yeah their connection have always been deep that always kind of made it seem like that was more of an edgar thing which the show's kind of leaned into obviously like everything with soldier boy and removing him from the board and homelander being kind of risen up and stuff like that so it seemed like out of anyone, he was tighter with Homelander. And he was, so I, I felt like complete utter bullshit because like no one really fucks with the deep in, amongst the seven. Once again, he's the end. He's at the very end of the um, all of it all. But basically, he was like, yo, like there was this Indonesian uh, village where Noir killed because like basically Vault was expanding into some stuff, and it's like, yeah, this river which they needed to survive or whatever. Like, yeah, he wiped out the village, came back with a hard on for a week. It's like, yeah, that's that's your motivation for um him. It's like, right, lean into the violence, you know. That kind of basically is like there's something hot about it, which him talking about it kind of seemed like he kind of got a chub from it too. It's like, yeah, it's you know, there's kind of basically lean into the violence of it all. So. I guess that means going forward, Black Noir 2.0 is going to be just as much of a psychopath too. Like, is that, yeah, that's how I get into character. I lean into, like, really enjoy the violence, and he's probably going to become a more fucked up individual because of it. He's done fucked up things, but he hasn't agreed with the fucked up things, so, but he's kept quiet about it up until now, so. That's going to be an interesting uh, story element and everything to see going forward. We had the Kimiko stuff where she is visiting Frenchie, but he doesn't want visitors. And so she kind of was dealing with that the entire episode until she shows up again. And the lady's like, yeah, I, I don't think he's going to change his mind. But she literally writes a note saying, like, I have nowhere else to go. It's like Frenchie is like home to her. So it's like, right, I'm not going to abandon him no matter how much he's not going to want to talk to me. He doesn't need to be alone in this moment. I've got nowhere else to go. This is where I need to be. And her even like crying a tear being like, yeah, because... What other home does she have outside of Frenchie? Like, yeah, she has the boys, but it's like, she once again, she's always found, he's always been kind of her true north for a while, you know? He kind of, he, he was the one that kind of cracked the shell of like when she was just kind of like the female before they found out she was Kimiko and he got to know more about her and her circumstances, so. It's, it's always the people, like, right, people push you away. That's when you kind of pull them in that much closer, so. And then finally, we have the um, butcher side of things, continuing with the Samir of it all. And I love they purposely gave Joe the lines about bashing someone's skull. And he said some other stuff that I was like, those have to be wink and nods to Walking Dead. Because if you've never seen The Walking Dead, spoilers, I mean, this is from like years ago at this one point in time. But his character Negan would, would bash people's head in with a bat with barbed wire to cross it. Bat's name is Lucille. There's actually an interesting backstory to that. But yeah, he would literally demolish demolish people's heads by literally bashing them and turning them into mush. So yeah, so like you're like, there's got to be level elements to that. Which is also interesting too, considering like Butcher. It's not the same thing, but like when he bashed in Mesmer's face on that bathroom sink um, in season one. 
kind of gives the same energy to some extent. Either way, they um, are trying to force Samir to make the virus, but he doesn't want to. Understandably, because it would mean killing Vicky and Zoe, so he's not too keen on it. But they're just trying to push, well, butcher it at the very least. is trying to push him to the point that, like, right, he's going to break. He's like, you've got a weak timeline to make this happen. So all the while this is happening, you know, he has Becca trying to reach out to him. He's like, right, you cut off someone's leg. Are you really okay? But for him, it's like, I've got to do this. Like, because she's like, is this even about saving Ryan anymore? Because now you're back to being old butcher. He's like, right, my only goal in life is killing Homelander. He's like, I've got to do this. I've got to save the world. But she points out, rightfully so, you're going to kill Homelander just to leave the world to deal with another one. Because where Ryan is right now, you're going to kill his dad. And that's going to send him over to Edge to become Homelander 2.0. So what do you do in that situation? What can you do? And he's just being so tugged on by where... Becca's telling him to go and then Joe leaving, like leaning into his darker intentions and demons and stuff because Joe's coming from the perspective of like he's like oh yeah like this duality once again that's, that's kind of another running theme this season too with the dualities with like uh of every character having their own dualities whether it's a train balancing up to what he's done up so far to trying to beat an, a legitimate hero annie and her identity between being uh starlight and annie and butcher literal uh angel and demon on his shoulder but joe had told the story about like right uh what he did in the military versus what he did when he came home and he just could never like be comfortable again and it you know obviously that's it's a much i mean it's already a dark situation in real life about you know soldiers who come home from military and all that they've seen the ptsd not being able to be home not being that person again it almost plays into the superheroism of it all in this ep in this episode in regard where he's like i don't who I was when I was out there torturing, killing people is like, yeah, that's the real me. And he's asking Butcher, is like, which one's the real you? You know, which is funny when the reveal happens because we find out truthfully, truthfully why Samir doesn't want to make the virus. Because the only way to make a virus, because Butcher's like, right, we'll just make something, a single dose, enough to kill Homelander. The only thing that could be potent enough to kill Homelander would mean like heavily increasing the power of the uh virus which would make it airborne and contagious so everything indira wanted it to be regardless you know everything she was aiming for in gen v it's like we would have to do that level the virus would have to reach that level and that would be a genocide it would wipe out every soup in the anyone with v in their system which would mean annie and kimiko and ryan and Vicky and Zoe. And that's why he's like, I cannot, like, regardless of what you're going to do to me, I can't do that because I cannot be, you know, responsible for the genocide of a whole bunch of people. Which even Butcher was on a second guessing it. But Joe's like, yo, this is it. This is the silver bullet we've been asking for. You've said time and time again in the past, they've all got to go. Which have literally been the words out of Butcher's mouth. Like, it came up, um... Which I think that was also supposed to be another sign. Because I think the only time he's ever said they've all got to go. I think he said that to Starlight in season two. He's like, it's nothing against you. It's just, you've all got to go. No, he it might, it might even have been last season he said that to Maeve. He's probably said it a couple of times. I I think that's what, I think he said it to Maeve last season. I, that might not even have been Starlight. might have been to Starlight. But I think he specifically, I might be remembering the time he said it to Maeve. Before like, you know, they were getting drunk and um, hooking up. It's funny enough when you think about it, because in that same conversation, he was like, well, great power has the absolute uh, possibility of turning into a right cunt or something like it's a play on the well, great power comes great responsibility conversation. So it's funny. I'm kind of bring up that particular scene in this context of this episode. But yeah, like, you know, Becca telling him not to do this, like be good. And then like Joe finally snapping and being like, shut up. And then that, I thought that was beautifully done. How like, once again, it was, it's a running theory a lot of people had, but I still think it was executed so beautifully for that to be the reveal of, nah, he's not real. And we find out the that was also the question of, feels poetic too, uh, but the question was like, right, the, we find out the real Joe is dead. It's poetic that Butcher would pick two people and of course it would be two dead people. So, and obviously we got the flashbacks of, oh yeah, like every time him was, he was talking to Joe, he was talking to himself, so. But, 
Because Joe's like, right, like, you never dragged me out of our situation where I said you, you did. Like, yeah, I died. He's like, no, 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 I would know that. He's like, you would, would you really, considering you have a veed up tumor on your fucking head? It's like, the fact is, you chose me. to Like, this isn't like, this is like, this is you. This is who you are on the inside. I represent your true intentions. I am you. The fact is that if you want to disagree with me, you're disagreeing with yourself because I'm, I'm a manifestation of your brain, meaning like some part of you wants this. Like, I am you. Both of them are, the once again, the literal angel and devil on his shoulder trying to sway his soul. This is a fight for Butcher's soul. And he's done some fucked up stuff, but he's willing to go this far. Because he's like, no one said anything about genocide, and this would be genocide. Are you willing to go that far for your get back, for your revenge? Like, your hatred for soups has, it runs pretty deep. But you're, that's also because, like, it gives you an outlet to focus your hatred on. Because just like Indira had Homelander to be, like, the focal point of her hate, but it still went to all soups regardless. So, it's kind of interesting that Butcher and Indira never directly got to talk. Granted, to our knowledge, Butcher was there on the phone when Grace was talking. To be fair, that could have easily been... M.M. and he sent Butcher to... Well, no, because like M.M. had no idea about the Godolkin thing, so it had to be like a... This is something um, Grace had Butcher handle on the side, maybe. I don't know. Giving him a shot. Who knows? But... He heard all that, so he probably heard a lot. Because everyone drew the parallels of Indira in that moment when she was talking to Grace. They're like, oh, she sounds like Butcher. So... And even if, even uh, Grace was referencing Butcher in that conversation, being like, yeah, you sound like one of your fellow, sh fellow countrymen in that same breath and everything. So Now the question becomes, what the hell is Butcher going to do? Will he even have much choice in the matter, considering like, well, he's like, yeah, I literally, when you blacked out, I protected you. Uh, I'm the one that took out Ezekiel. The stain can take control over his body and just do its own thing. We almost still don't... The bunny gave us an idea, but we still have no idea what it looks like when, quote-unquote, Joe comes out when it comes to Butcher. Like, what that, like, physically looks like to him. So, it's going to be interesting to see where the next episode takes us with all of this. Only two episodes left in the season, though. It's going to be interesting to see what happens. But really, that's all I want to talk about. So, the next time we meet, be happy, be safe, live life to the fullest, and... Enjoy it. Good day and goodbye.